We're delighted to have um, Dr. Brian Bird from the University of Michigan present to us on aldosterone uh, and, and hypertension and cardiorenal health. Uh, Dr. Bird is a cardiologist who actually has a clinical pharmacologist training from Vanderbilt and then did his cardiology fellowship at, at uh, Denver. Uh, in Colorado. So he is presently at the University of Michigan, uh, which is, I guess, the birthplace of uh, of uh, al primary aldosteronism with Kahn syndrome. Uh, and he's got several grants and publications, uh, including just wrapping up the SALTY study, which was on uh, really low sodium di uh, diet versus high sodium and, and studying urinary vesicles and uh, uh, biomarkers. Uh, so, you know, please uh, take it from here, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here and it's nice to see a number of familiar faces and uh, I, I'm very glad to, to also become uh, acquainted with uh, others too. So uh, I want to share a few perspectives on hypertension, cardiorenal health, aldosterone. Let me see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So by way of disclosures, uh, there are a few things. I've had, had funding from a number of different uh, funding organizations. I'm an advisory board member for a company uh, developing something unrelated to what I'm going to talk about today, and I found an award for data sharing. I'm an editor for Springer Nature. So by way of overview, I'm going to speak today about some ancestral aldosterone physiology, by which I mean the physiology before the uh, advent of the salt shaker, basically, and then modern aldosterone physiology and the different physiological challenge that that presents compared to the ancestral problem that it was uh, solved by aldosterone. Uh, I'm going to speak about evidence that mineral metabolism affects longevity, and I'll describe to some extent how aldosterone and minerals interact, and I'll also discuss a, the uh, some recent uh, developments in the diagnosis and treatment of mineralocorticoid sodium interactions. In terms of aldosterone physiology in the ancestral sense before the uh, salt mining uh, invention, the uh, you could think of aldosterone as having been a solution to the physiologic problem of poor availability of sodium and poor retention in the body. So sodium presented a physiological problem because it was an essential aspect of action potentials and other aspects of human physiology, but it was limited in its availability for consumption. Uh, so people would get what they could from plants and uh, things like that, but they just don't have much sodium in them. They would try to eat uh, animals uh, when they could and recycle the sodium in the animals. Uh, probably cannibalism had something to do with uh, sodium deprivation in some contexts. Uh, the issue is that dietary sodium is absorbed uh, by the, through the intestines. It's filtered through the renal glomerulus because it's so small in size and uh, reabsorption from uh, the urine was absolutely essential so that you didn't have to constantly be eating sodium in a sodium poor environment. Of course, we know that what aldosterone does is that it uh, permeates through the uh, cell membrane, binds to mineralocorticoid receptors that reside in the cytoplasm. These receptors likely dimerize and then translocate to mineralocorticoid response elements uh, in various genes throughout the genome, uh, activating certain genes like SGK1, GIL-Z, uh, and this increases the residence of the amyloride-sensitive epithelial sodium channel, or ENAC, at the apical surface of the uh, epithelial cells in the distal renal tubule and collecting duct. That allows the passage of sodium into the cells and then back through the basolateral membrane into the blood. And that type of uh, reabsorption was absolutely crucial in low sodium civilizations, some of which uh, have existed into modernity, including the Yanomami and some groups in Papua New Guinea. This is, uh, these are data from a uh, study that was done in the 1970s that included a University of Michigan personnel who visited the Yanomami and what they found was that in comparison to the controls, which were the investigators themselves, the Yanomami excreted far, far less uh, sodium in 24 hours. The controls, the investigators uh, excreted about 2,400 uh, milligrams of sodium in 24 hours, and the Yanomami uh, 
excreted on average 23 milligrams. And if we assume there are some sweat losses and fecal losses, then almost certainly they're consuming less than 100 uh, milligrams of sodium a day. When we look at the blood pressures as measured in the 1970s, you'll notice that the blood pressures in males and females in the Yanomami on that low sodium diet, which was also a high potassium diet, this is a very highly active population without obesity, uh, the blood pressures are low compared to in uh, the United States or Canada, and they also did not rise perceptibly with age. Another group more recently visited uh, and this is a work from uh, Johns Hopkins group and published in JAMA Cardiology. And what they found was indeed the age systolic blood pressure slope for Yanomami individuals continues to be flat. It, it just blood pressure does not increase with age. And then they also visited a group of individuals called the Yaquana who have an airstrip nearby and have access to more modern conveniences, things like sodium, and there is a uh, mildly positive age systolic blood pressure relationship in that group. When we go over to Papua New Guinea, we find that there can be, in fact, even an, a negative relationship between age and systolic blood pressure on a, a low sodium diet uh, of less than 500 milligrams of sodium per day. And I've always found this study interesting. This is a study of 1,000 consecutive admissions to the medical ward of the Port Moresby Hospital in Papua New Guinea. And it's essentially 1,000 admissions and then a separate 1,000 consecutive admissions. And what they found was that only 0.9% of the admissions were for cardiovascular diseases. So this is, of course, markedly different from what we see in uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, there are some things pushing that down like snake bite, but in general, it seems like this just isn't a very prevalent problem. And there are other studies that have been done in Papua New Guinea, ECG surveys, blood pressure measurement surveys that confirm there just does not appear to be much in the way of ischemic heart disease there. When we think about modern aldosterone physiology, what I can say is that the problem of having to retain sodium in the body has been fixed. Boy, did we fix that. We get lots and lots of sodium in our diet. And if you look at 24-hour urinary sodium excretion uh, in the NHANES study, which is a national uh, survey in the United States, it turns out that females uh, excrete more than 3,000 milligrams. Uh, or let's just say that the mean sodium intake is estimated to be more than 3,000 milligrams. Uh, by the 24-hour urinary uh, excretion, and for males, more than 4,000 milligrams. So now the issue is not uh, how can we retain enough sodium in our body, but rather can we shut off aldosterone production sufficiently to allow enough of it to escape. Aldosterone regulates the final stages of sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule and collecting duct, of course, and it only regulates the absorption of 1% to 5% of filtered sodium. But since the kidney filters the entire circulating plasma twice an hour, that's 180 liters of plasma a day. This has an important net effect. For, so according to the AHA, for adults needing blood pressure reduction, in 2017, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines recommend a 1,500 milligram uh, sodium per day diet, which is 0.75 teaspoons of table salt or 65 milliequivalents of sodium. And a healthy adult will filter about 25,560 milliequivalents or 588 grams of sodium daily and will reabsorb 99.97% of the filtered load. Increased sodium intake increases blood pressure in a variety of different short-term studies where uh, supplementation is used to increase the amount of sodium or where the diet is used to increase the amount of sodium. This seems to be true across a very wide range of sodium intake. And one of the questions that has been highlighted by the processed food industry over the years is that uh, short-term changes are one thing, long-term changes are another. And it was hard to prove in any sort of a randomized trial that there is a sustained increase in blood pressure with differences in sodium intake. So Derek Denton did a very nice uh, uh, study uh, originally published in Nature Medicine and referenced in this very, very elegant work published in Journal of Human Hypertension called Can Hypertension Be Prevented? In this study, he took chimpanzees whose 
baseline diet is a lot of fruits and vegetables and this type of thing. And he supplemented their diet with initially 1.8 grams of uh, sodium and then 3.6 grams and then 5.4 grams. And what you can see is that in this experimental group, as opposed to the control group where no sodium was added, the blood pressure uh, continued to increase in proportion to the amount of sodium added to the diet. And after the sodium was removed from the diet, the blood pressure came down. And this was over the course of a couple of years. So uh, truly a long-term and sustained increases in blood pressure do occur. Like humans, there was variability in the increase in blood pressure. So there is a salt sensitivity phenotype that is also seen in these non-human primates. It's not solely a human trait. So of course, there are all sorts of things that happen in the Yanomami culture. Uh, there are many other uh, possible explanations for why the blood pressures are low or why people in Papua New Guinea might have lower incident cardiovascular disease and minerals may or may not have anything to do with it. Uh, even if I think there's some evidence that that, that probably does pay or play a role based upon the increases in blood pressure. One thing that uh, helps us clarify whether minerals are indeed important is the SSASS study in which uh, people in 600 rural villages in China were randomly assigned to one of two interventions. And the way this worked is they cluster randomized at the level of the village. So 300 villages uh, were randomized to distribute a salt substitute. 25% of the mass of the sodium chloride had been replaced by potassium chloride or usual uh, sodium chloride for people interested in participating in the study. And they recruited almost 21,000 people who were at high risk of stroke by virtue of having had a stroke or being 60 years of age uh, and, uh, uh, and having high blood pressure. So they predicted that the uh, incidence of stroke, the rate, the rate of stroke would be decreased, and indeed it was by about 14% uh, in the intervention arm, uh, and the major adverse cardiovascular events were reduced by 13%, and death was reduced by 12%. So something very powerful happened with a pretty small intervention. They also looked at the safety issue, uh, and what they found was that there was no statistically significant difference in hyperkalemia in the two groups. Bruce Neal was one of the investigators from that uh, prior study, the SSASS study. He also worked with investigators in China separately on another study uh, in nursing homes. And in this study, there was randomization to that type of a salt substitute, just very slightly different, but essentially the same salt substitute as the last study, uh, versus usual salt for preparation of food in these nursing homes. They also uh, did an arm that involved restricted salt supply versus usual supply. And as you can see, cardiovascular events were markedly reduced in the salt substitute arm. There was no difference in the restricted salt supply arm. And uh, total mortality uh, showed uh, some trend toward being reduced in the salt substitute arm, even though this was a much smaller study than SSASS. Uh, and uh, was not reduced by restricted salt supply. Uh, but there is uh, one little wrinkle about that. They sort of concluded that restricted salt supply doesn't work. But the last table in their supplement, if as, at least per my interpretation, shows that the change in 24-hour urinary sodium for baseline to the end of the intervention uh, in the salt substitute arm was minus 43.6 millimoles per liter, and then the, so the, the restricted salt arm was minus 44.9 uh, millimoles per liter, and in the control arm where no intervention was made was minus 48.6 uh, millimoles per liter. So I get the impression that their restricted salt intervention was just an utter failure. At least that, that's how I'm interpreting that and be interested in what other people think. So how do mineralocorticoids like aldosterone fit into this picture? Well, I think in the 1930s, we can pick up the initial signal that mineralocorticoids were interacting with sodium to cause big problems. There, there was a problem in the 1930s of tuberculosis and adrenal insufficiency as a consequence of tuberculosis in the United States. And one of the things that happened around them was the development of uh, deoxycorticosterone acetate. And 
what would happen if people came in in an, uh, an, an Addisonian crisis is that they would be given both deoxycorticosterone acetate and sodium saline. And what was noted at the time was that that combination sometimes took people whose chest x-ray looked like uh, the chest x-ray on the right and turned them into people who looked like the chest x-ray on the left. And there were a couple of cases reported in JAMA of that. And in fact, they report uh, two people died in the setting of the admixture of saline plus uh, a powerful corticoid substance. And what they said in that JAMA article was extreme caution must be exercised in the administration of desoxycorticosterone esters because excessive amounts may lead to the development of hypoproteinemia, uh, marked edema, and cardiac insufficiency. And then they put an addendum. Since this article is written, it's been found that patients do most satisfactorily with small doses of synthetic hormone without the addition of salt beyond that in the usual diet. And they talk about how pulling back the salt in the diet that they were supplementing with actually seemed to rescue somebody from the brink. Uh, so I believe it was that observation that seemed to trigger Hans Seeley's interest in the so-called electro electrolyte steroid cardiopathies that he studied in Montreal, in which he demonstrated in a variety of different animal models that the uh, provision of a mineralocorticoid substance combined with a high sodium diet, uh, sometimes in sometimes nephrectomy, could cause a very, very significant uh, cardiomyopathy and also uh, injury to the kidney as well as hypertension. And that work led to decades of progress, including primary aldosteronism having been discovered in 1955 by Jerome Kahn at the University of Michigan, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists having been developed and being shown to prevent electro, uh, electrolyte steroid tissue injury and fibrosis in rodents, first using uh, mineralocorticoids like DOCA and then eventually using aldosterone to demonstrate the same thing. Uh, there was a nice study from France showing that mineralocorticoid receptor haploinsufficiency in humans leads to supranormal diastolic function in humans despite high aldo and high sodium intake in those patients, suggesting that the uh, mineralocorticoid receptor signaling itself is central to the pathology, which is again also suggested by the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists' effects on these phenotypes. There have been more recent discoveries, as, as I think many people in the room know. Uh, Rick Lifton discovered that aldosterone-producing adenomas often contain somatic mutations in KCNJ5, and then a catalog of other somatic mutations and some germline mutations have now also been linked to aldosterone-producing adenomas. We still lack a substantive progress on why people develop bilateral idiopathic uh, hyperaldosteronism. There's some hints that the uh, adrenals in that situation do also contain mutations, but we're really very uh, early in the process of understanding that. There have been additional key discoveries that have set the stage for where we are today, including Bertram Pitt at the University of Michigan showing in the Rawls trial that spironolactone reduces mortality very pro potently in patients treated with uh, uh, I'm sorry, patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. He went on to show that the same is true with uh, aplerinone in the Ephesus and Emphasis HF trials. Uh, in addition, he also showed uh, that the non-steroidal MRA phenarinone improves cardiac and renal outcomes in diabetic nephropathy in the Figaro DKD and Fidelio DKD studies, uh, you know, leading to the approval of that drug by the FDA. So, We've had a lot of important uh, changes in the landscape with respect to how people think about aldosterone and the ways that people are trying to intervene in its uh, uh, interactions with mineral minerals that, that cause tissue damage. So one of the things that has happened in the relatively recent past is a very nice study uh, from Ananvidia's group showing that if you salt load a very large number of people, and then look at the 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion in those individuals, it's not the case that there are people who are normal and there are people who are abnormal and there's no similarity between the two. It, instead, it's a, a continuous spectrum of 
insuppressible secretion of aldosterone in the setting of eating high salt diet. And this is true both in people without hypertension and then in people with hypertension. More people with more advanced forms of hypertension will have uh, a 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion that is above an arbitrary threshold of, let's say, 12 micrograms for 24 hours, but it truly is arbitrary. And if you look at the Endocrine Society guidelines about what is a confirmatory amount of aldosterone being secreted in the urine in 24 hours, it essentially depends upon what institution you're at, and, and uh, it, it's a genuinely arbitrary issue. So this is another way of looking at the data. These um, plots show the distribution of 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion in the untreated normotensive people who were salt-loaded, and then the untreated stage one hypertension, untreated stage two, and then treated resistant hypertension. You see the shift to the right in the probability density. And then you can also see that this is true both in an unadjusted as well as an adjusted fashion uh, that the uh, urinary aldosterone excretion increases as the stage or severity of the hypertension worsens. And this has led uh, Dr. Vaidya and others to consider the um, phenotype of autonomous aldosterone secretion to have a very broad spectrum, a wide spectrum that isn't properly classified as sort of normal or, or abnormal, but rather uh, needs to be thought of in a much more subtle way. I think that's accurate. Uh, and uh, there's a very nice review, uh, Endocrine Reviews 2018, uh, describing some of the th current thinking. There's a brand new paper that somebody on Twitter shared yesterday and asked uh, uh, Swapnil to get my opinion of. And it's an interesting paper. It's a single author paper about uh, renaming primary aldosteronism the syndrome of inappropriate aldosterone secretion. Uh, and I, I don't have a very strong feeling, but I did notice that uh, in keeping with what I've been thinking about lately, the different thresholds that are codified as the answer to figuring out whether or not you have primary aldosteronism are alluded to in this uh, document. And I think that that's a good point. It, it's truly arbitrary. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Funder is right that we should think of six micrograms in 24 hours as abnormal or 10 or 12 or 14. Uh, but it's clearly the case that in the setting of adult life in the United States, in Canada, people are eating enough, enough sodium that we don't need much aldosterone. And so uh, we could always, depending upon how we want to think about this, we could always set the uh, threshold for making a binary diagnosis of primary aldosteronism lower. And I suspect that that will happen over time. So what are the implications for the treatment of hypertension? Well, some people can and should undergo adrenalectomy to cure primary aldosteronism, but of course that necessitates diagnosing the primary aldosteronism. And I just looked at uh, the, if, the, basically the recent papers, and there have been many of them lately, about screening for primary aldosteronism in different populations. And what uh, comes through is that people just don't screen much, basically. Uh, and I'll dig into one of these papers, but uh, they're all interesting in their own right. Uh, so almost nobody screens for PA. So this is a, a paper that we contributed on that topic with uh, Jordi Cohen and Vivek Bala and others. And we looked at 269,000 uh, veterans in the United States Veterans Health Administration who had apparent incident treatment resistant hypertension. And I say apparent because we couldn't be sure that they were adherent with their medications. It wasn't really a way for us to check that. And in principle, these people should be tested per the endocrine society guidelines by virtue of their having uh, resistant hypertension. They should be tested for primary aldosteronism. Now, of course, there must be some fraction of the people who are known not to be taking their medications and that type of thing. There's probably uh, any number of reasons why somebody might not test uh, and, and have a good reason for that. But what you can see is and we, when we looked at all of these different uh, VA centers uh, across the country, these bars represent the number of patients with uh, 
incident treatment resistant hypertension. And the little green cap represents the people who were tested for primary aldosteronism. So it was a minuscule proportion, 1.6% of the total population. And when we looked at whether this was changing over the years, uh, the answer was no, we had more patients um, that entered, that, that met eligibility as the years went by, but the fraction who were actually screened for treatment resistant, I'm sorry, for primary aldosteronism among the treatment resistant hypertensive patients was pretty fixed. They really didn't improve. When we looked at uh, factors that seemed to predict whether or not people would be tested, we found that older patients were tested less often, uh, patients who had a higher systolic blood pressure or hypokalemia or black race were all more likely to be tested. Uh, then when we looked at the provider who first saw the patient when they met the criteria for treatment-resistant hypertension, what was that visit? Who was seeing the patient? Uh, well, if they were seen at that visit by nephrology, they were more likely to have been tested. If they were seen by endocrinology, they were even more likely to be tested. Uh, if they were seen by cardiology, they were a little less likely to be tested, not statistically significantly different from primary care, compared to primary care as a reference. And then we didn't find major differences uh, between high volume centers and low volume centers, academic affiliation, rural location was uh, associated with less testing. And then we asked the question, well, could it be that people are simply bypassing testing? Uh, and I'll show you why they might have considered doing that. Uh, and just treating with a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And so what we did was we looked at the adjusted hazard ratio for initiating mineral corticoid receptor antagonist therapy uh, on or after the testing of these people uh, for primary aldosteronism. And what we found was that essentially, if they were tested, there was a fourfold higher likelihood that they would be started on a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So it looked like it wasn't just people skipping mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, but rather that they uh, were skipping that and, and testing and treating, basically. So why do I say that there's some rationale for skipping testing? Well, there is the pathway to trial. In this trial, uh, it was a randomized crossover study in which patients were supervised in specialist hypertension clinics. If the person was thought to have secondary or accelerated hypertension, that was an exclusion criterion. And the, so that's one caveat when I say that it might be reasonable in some settings to skip testing. And that's if, if you essentially do not think that the person has overt primary aldosteronism, those people were not included in this trial. Renin was measured and people were taking usual A, C, and D therapy uh, for their hypertension. So these are patients with treatment resistant hypertension. And the question was, which add on fourth drug would lower the blood pressure the best? And they used home blood pressure, which is relatively innovative at the time. And what we can see here is the upper box is the systolic blood pressure, the lower box is the diastolic blood pressure. And at baseline, uh, measurements were made at home. During placebo, and I should mention these, there was no washout period, but these were. Uh, Medications were given in random order. Uh, there was a placebo effect, if you will. And then spironolactone caused the greatest and the most consistent reduction in blood systolic blood pressure compared with doxazosin or bisoprolol. And when the investigators tried to understand to what extent the baseline renin measurement in the entire population of people that they studied predicted the response to these medications. Not surprisingly, it didn't, it didn't have very much predictive power in for, for doxazosin or bisoprolol, but it actually uh, had only very weak predictive power uh, for uh, spironolactone. So the R squared was 0 0.037. So about 4% of the variability in the change in home systolic blood pressure was predicted by baseline renin. So really not, not a very uh, strong predictor. They did a subset analysis where they measured aldosterone in addition to the renin. And in that subset, what they found was that the renin had a little bit better predictive power for whatever reason of about 12% uh, of the variability in the change in systolic blood pressure being predicted by the renin. 
but aldosterone was particularly poor, uh, only 3% of the uh, change in systolic blood pressure could be explained by baseline aldosterone. Aldosterone to renin ratio was a bit more powerful with 14% of the variation being explained, uh, or explainable, I should say. And, you know, you might think with what I just showed you, suggesting that across a broad swath of people with resistant hypertension, uh, essentially irrespective of their baseline renin and aldo, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists being very effective for treating resistant hypertension, that it would be widely used, uh, that they would be widely used. I, I don't think that they are, though. The uh, Here's a study from 2016 showing that aldosterone antagonists, as they call them, or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, as they're more properly called, were being used in you know, less than 10% of people who had treatment-resistant hypertension. And then when you look at the fact that we know mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone reduce mortality, you might certainly expect that they are being, in heart failure, I should say, you might expect that they're being used in heart failure. But uh, in fact, two studies have shown that no more than a third of people in the most recent years who look like they're ideal candidates for mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists for heart failure are receiving those medications. So there's a tremendous underuse of these medications. There was a mixed methods study done by Dev and colleagues asking, why do you think clinicians don't prescribe mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists? And the most common answer was the potential for side effects. People fear hyperkalemia. And in the end, we concluded there's an unmet need for biomarkers of mineralocorticoid receptor activation. It seems like plasma or urinary aldosterone are not very predictive of blood pressure response. Baseline aldosterone and renin ratio is sort of weakly predictive. Serum or plasma potassium are confounded by diet and renal function. And plasma renin activity in the very circumscribed setting of primary aldosteronism seems to work reasonably well uh, as sort of an inverse marker of mineralocorticoid receptor activation. But it must clearly have a U-shaped relationship because people who have heart failure have high renin and high mineralocorticoid receptor activation. It's clearly not a readout for mineralocorticoid receptor activation per se. So I think a lot of us got interested in work that Mark Nepper did showing that uh, urinary extracellular vesicles secreted uh, from renal tubular cells into the urine included a number of different proteins relevant to sodium reabsorption, including things like ACE, Alpha ENAC, beta ENAC, gamma ENAC, NCC, NKCC2. And Mark, uh, sorry, Matt Luther, uh, an old uh, colleague of mine with whom I trained at Vanderbilt, started to do some uh, very nice uh, multi dimensional protein identifications. This is a mass spec te technique called Mud Pit, in which he looked at people who were on high salt diet or low salt diet. And what he found was that uh, high salt diet suppressed ENAC gamma peptide in urinary extracellular vesicles, whereas during high salt diet, the administration of aldosterone would stimulate the presence of ENAC gamma peptide in the urinary extracellular vesicles, and or low salt diet would do the same. And he also was able to see some correlations between aldosterone levels in patients or in study participants, I should say, and gamma ENAC peptide. So there's a hint that gamma enac peptide uh, was a readout for mineralocorticoid receptor activation. We were pursuing this simultaneously with him and using a slightly different tack. Uh, we wondered whether urinary extracellular vesicle shuttled mRNA might be a more direct readout of mineralocorticoid receptor activation, since the proximate event after activation of the mineralocorticoid receptor is changes in gene transcription. We also were aware that a urinary mRNA uh, I'm sorry, urinary extracellular vesicle mRNA sequencing project had been undertaken uh, that showed that you can read out approximately 13,500 of the 21,000 protein coding genes uh, using that method, which is very, very comprehensive compared to most omics methods. So we were quite interested in this. So our approach was seeking not, excuse me, seeking not the sodium channel per se, but a biomarker of mineralocorticoid receptor activation 
The uh, proximate event indicating MR activation is changes in gene expression, as I just said, and we were interested in urinary cell vesicles that might contain molecules from the renal tubular epithelial cells. And we knew that EV enclosed RNA in human urine could be assayed. So our hypothesis was that it was possible to detect mineralic corticoid receptor activation using mRNA shuttled in extracellular vesicles. And we wondered, could we use the mRNA as a biomarker of a process occurring in the kidney? To what extent does mRNA shuttled in urinary extracellular vesicles uh, mirror gene expression in the cells of the kidney? That's sort of a question that precedes whether you can use the vesicles to, to say anything about the kidney. So one of the things we did was we used the publicly available uh, sequencing data from the uh, study I showed earlier, which had looked at mRNA sequencing of urinary extracellular vesicles in a healthy male. And then we looked at males' kidney cortex samples, which were posthumous samples, in the GTEx consortium, and those had also been subjected to RNA sequencing. We analyzed the data in two strata for the correlation between the uh, normalized abundance of various transcripts in the urinary EVs from the healthy volunteer and the kidney cortex samples from the uh, deceased donors. And the two strata that we analyzed this in were intended to lead us away from being um, misled by highly expressed housekeeping genes and other things that are ubiquitously expressed in any tissue. So what we did was the red bars represent the strata of genes that are highly enriched in kidney tissue, according to uh, analyses in GTEx that others had done. And the blue bars represent ubiquitously expressed genes. And what we saw was that the correlation between these you know, uh, uh, urinary EVs and the kidney cortex samples were quite high, considering that we really did not uh, th th these were not the same person. And so the one was in the living state and others were deceased donors. So there's a relatively high correlation in terms of the kidney enriched genes. So I collaborated with Scott Hummel uh, at the University of Michigan. He had asked men and women with prehypertension to consume a low sodium diet of 20 millimoles per day. He collected uh, blood and urine and uh, archived those. Then he infused sodium and asked them to eat a high, uh, very salty meal and then collected sodium, uh, I'm sorry, uh, high sodium samples in that setting. My lab designed uh, novel assays for urinary EV shuttled target genes of the mineralic corticoid receptor. And we also had some control genes that we expected not to change in the setting of mineralic corticoid receptor activation one of which was NR3C2, the mineralocorticoid receptor itself. We found that the uh, salt loading did indeed suppre suppress plasmarinin activity, as well as serum aldosterone concentration, as we expected that they would. And of course, after salt loading, the spot urinary sodium was increased and creatinine was not affected. So what we found was that a variety of genes, uh, the alpha subunit of the epithelial sodium channel, ENAC, and also the gamma subunit, SGK1 and TSC22D3, were suppressed in their expression by salt loading. In addition, we looked at the log serum aldosterone concentration and looked at the CT value, which as you may recall, is inversely related to how much gene expression there is. So what we found was that as uh, serum aldosterone concentration was higher, there was lower, ex I'm sorry, there was a higher expression of these genes and lower CT value. And these are the same genes that we found to be significant in terms of being suppressed by salt loading. And those same genes we found to be also uh, correlated inversely with urinary sodium ex excretion uh, in terms of their gene expression. So in conclusion, the transcriptome of urinary extracellular vesicles shares similarity with the transcriptome of the renal cortex, and transcripts of MR target genes were detected in cell-depleted urine after enrichment for extracellular vesicles. 
Low sodium, uh, low dietary sodium was accompanied by increased abundance of MR target gene transcripts and abundance of MR target gene transcripts associated with serum aldosterone concentration in urinary sodium excretion. Following up on this work, we've done a prospective study that we call SALTY, in which healthy volunteers have been randomized to eat 300 millimoles per day of sodium or 10 millimoles per day of sodium. Then they under, that's for eight days. They underwent a washout where they consumed their usual diet, and then eight days of the opposite diet that they hadn't consumed yet. We have ongoing work analyzing the urinary metabolome during the high and low salt diets. Uh, we've seen lots of differences. Unfortunately, if you've done any metabolomics work, one of the things you'll realize is that a lot of the differences that you find are unlabeled and we're not certain what they are. But we also were able to look at a number of different uh, labeled um, differences that we know were statistically significant. We have the impression that there may be some uh, oxidative stress uh, that is represented in the results that we found. We're continuing to follow that up. And again, we can see that there's some differences that survive false discovery rate when you limit uh, false, false discovery uh, correction when you limit this to those things which are labeled. Uh, we also have uh, samples from patients with primary aldosteronism. These are urine samples, 120 baseline urine samples, and 24 after treatment with surgery or a uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and we're going to be doing urinary extracellular arm mRNA analyses on those. And we think that this work will be important going forward because, as you may be aware, there are many drugs in development, and of course, FDA-approved drugs that relate to this biology. The aldosterone synthase inhibitors are being developed now uh, after initial problems that really were prohibitive in, uh, in terms of accidentally also inhibiting uh, the uh, synthesis of cortisol. It seems as though those issues have largely been overcome. Then we're also looking at uh, the development of other molecules that affect the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that are likely to come to the fore in the future, as well as uh, the uh, panoply of medications that already are known to affect this system. So we have a number of plans for the SALTI study completed as the urinary and plasma metabolomics, which we're continuing to analyze. And then we have plans to do uh, sequencing of urinary extracellular vesicles from the supernatant of 24-hour urine samples. And we have this uh, slow off rate modified aptum or soma based uh, scan that we're going to be doing on the baseline and the washout as well as the high and low salt urinary and plasma samples in a collaboration with uh, SomaLogic. And this is a group in Finland with whom we're uh, interested in collaborating to try to replicate that type of uh, mRNA profiling that they have done. Looking at diabetic kidney disease, we'd like to look at the effects of sodium on the kidney using our salty samples in a similar manner. And as I mentioned, we're also looking at uh, changes in EV biomarkers uh, that reflect mineralocorticoid receptor activation before and after the treatment of primary aldosteronism. And I think that's plenty, so I just wanted to, to stop there and I think there's some time for questions. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, uh, Brian, for that wonderful overview. I love the historical old uh, science that you showed. Um, I'm sure people have questions, so please unmute yourself uh, or, or raise your hand and I can call upon you uh, when you have questions. And if I can uh, start with, uh, you know, you showed that wonderful data on high. So high aldosterone is bad uh, as the animal data and, and other studies, studies show. Uh, but there are some, uh, I would like your opinion on, on some body of research that shows that, you know, plasma aldosterone goes up. Uh, in the setting of either a low sodium diet, but these days also with high potassium diet. Um, you know, my uh, my bias is that it doesn't matter, uh, but what is your uh, con concept? Like, that, do we need to have high sodium with high aldosterone to cause badness, or is aldosterone bad in itself? That's a great question. I know that there are some studies for, that um, in the setting of the types of diets that are consumed in the United States, there's some signal that just having aldosterone uh, around is enough to tell you whether people will develop incident hypertension with some predictive power. I'm thinking of Framingham study that showed that. They didn't look at renin, they just looked at aldosterone and it was predictive of incident hypertension. Uh, 
there are other studies that have shown that you really need renin uh, to bolster that signal so that it's statistically significant, so that you end up needing to look at either the renin itself or the aldosterone to renin ratio, which seems much more powerful than, than other things, uh, than, than aldosterone by itself. But my guess is what's going on there is if you look at aldosterone, see, aldosterone is not going to predict incident hypertension in the Yanomami, right? <laughs> I mean, if you look at the 24-hour urinary aldosterone uh, excretion there, it's incredibly high compared to here. Um, but nobody's hypertensive. So it's not bad in and of itself, uh, but in the setting of a high-sodium diet, that's where I think you run into problems. And, and it seems that essentially we're very well adapted to increasing our aldosterone production as must have been essential for our survival at some point in history. But we don't seem to be quite as well adapted to uh, sh shutting it off when we don't need it. So, but your question about uh, potassium is really good. I don't, I've, I've written one grant that didn't get funded that sort of addressed that as directly as I could. Um, I'm hoping that I can write some kind of a project that really gets at that more directly. Um, I don't think it's well understood. You know, the, one of the other things that's related to that is the FDA has, uh, I was surprised to learn they have these things called standards of identity, where they say, if you say this is bread, it needs to have at a minimum the following ingredients. And so they've actually, and these are matters of law. So they've actually said, you have to have salt in your bread, for example. And uh, they recently have permitted uh, manufacturers of food in some settings to be able to say that they're using a potassium salt instead of salt. And I think some people have told me they don't want to use the word potassium chloride because it has some, some negative connotations uh, related to capital punishment and stuff. But anyway, the, the concept I think is that uh, the FDA seems to be warming to the idea of using potassium salts. And one of the things they recently asked for public comment on is whether all of the standards of identity should, in a sweeping fashion, permit the substitution of potassium salt where salt is used, uh, just so that it would sort of make it easy for companies to start putting more potassium in the diet. And I'm sure this is influenced by studies like SSASS, um, but whether or not that might stimulate some aldosterone production in the setting of people who are eating salt. And, I mean, I don't know. It's a great question. I don't think I know the answer yet. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you have uh, uh, sort of answered uh, uh, the question, and we are on the same page. Uh, yeah. Dylan, uh, Dylan's at uh, a conference, so he's sneakily asking a question in the chat. Um, so yeah. I, I read it out for you. Uh, he's asking whether the RNA signatures in the uh, EVs uh, they show associations with fibrotic pathways or just ENAC. Well, we haven't yet been able to do anything comprehensive, so we have not. We've only looked at targeted things so far, which didn't include fibrotic pathways. So we don't, we have not yet done those experiments that would tell us. But my hope is that in conjunction and collaboration with the group in Finland, that we'll be able to do a comprehensive RNA sequencing of those vesicles that will let us answer a question like that, because that's a great question and one that we're very interested in. So, so that is in the works, that's... Uh, that's something that, yeah, that's one of the things that I hope we would learn from the RNA sequencing. Um, but uh, the, the issue is that is, is getting enough money to do the RNA sequencing. That's the, it's always tricky. Um, the qPCR, you know, okay, we can get the money for that. But the money to do both the sequencing and then the analytics is, is fairly expensive. So we're working on that currently. Uh, and then if I can flip back to a uh, clinical uh, aspect. So so that, that data on, on the abysmal rate of primary aldosteronism screening uh, that you've shown. Uh, and yeah, it, it's it's a small uh, uh, pleasure that nephrologists do better than cardiologists. Uh, but I would confess that uh, until, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago when uh, Greg Huntemar came to Ottawa, we were among those who were not screening. Uh, I suspect, uh, and I speak for some of my colleagues here, that we, we were like, hey, what does it matter? Let's give spironolactone. And I mm -hmm. suspect we were not good at doing spironolactone. But, you know, since Greg convinced us that this is important, we we now screen, at least in our hypertension clinic, we screen uh, 
everyone you know we don't even look at uh, uh, at the concept everyone gets a rene and analdo uh, without uh, without any uh, concerns about what else is going on right just as a screening to make you think about it just to nudge us to think about it because if we rely on physicians to decide who should be screened and not you know uh, it, it it is uh, it doesn't happen as well as it should uh, right. we, we trick ourselves do you have any ideas or or thoughts about what we can do here and you know we have been talking about this forever about right. awareness but it hasn't happened right well i think there's different possibilities adina turku here at the university of michigan has set up a so-called best practice alert in epic our electronic health record that basically triggers based on certain things uh presence of risk factors for primary aldosteronism the uh, it triggers a little flag in the chart that says hey you might want to screen it's very easy to not do anything with it uh you don't you don't have to click anything you just see it there so um i don't know i'm sure she'll present her results at some point in terms of how that affected behavior and i suspect more people are screening i've gotten the uh impression from talking with her and others that people are screening they're asking her what what to do that's one of the issues is if you get a lot of people to screen there is always the question of now how do we interpret which is a little bit hard to kind of uh that's also hard to roll out uh in terms of knowledge then dan herman at penn i'm collaborating with him and we're trying to do computational phenotyping in the chart to discover what can we train a machine learning algorithm to identify people who seem like they probably have primary aldosteronism and we have positive controls because we have the Michigan Endocrine Oncology Repository, which includes a bunch of people with primary aldosteronism. So we can use that to test whether or not the algorithm is sensitive. Uh, and because if it doesn't pick up those people, it, it wasn't very sensitive, that kind of thing. So we're working on uh, trying to look at this from a few different perspectives. And, and then, you know, this issue of whether or not it's good enough to uh, simply treat I think your point was really well made that maybe we weren't using Spyro all that well, uh, because one of the questions that uh, Greg's work has raised is, you know, wait a minute, if the renin doesn't come up, are you done? Uh, it, it, you know, even if you choose that pathway of using a medical therapy, it seems like the answer to that may well be no. And so one of the things that I do is I work really closely with the primary aldosteronism endocrinologists here at Michigan, and because the disease was discovered here, we have you know, like three people who actually just work on that a lot. And so I work with them a lot and they'll they'll continue to watch the renin and make sure that it goes up and they'll use doses of spironolactone that I sometimes find, you know, or might be outside my comfort zone as a cardiologist or hypertension specialist, but they are com comfortable with it and they, they see good success. So on that note, uh, and you're right, you know, we are I'm using upwards of 100 milligrams of spironolactone, which <laughs> is not very comfortable for sure. You get all these alerts on Epic saying, hey, are you sure you want to do that? Are you crazy for using these doses? Um, right. And I, as, as an ALDO expert, can I ask your opinion about all these other agents which are now filtering through? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, like pyranolactone is so cheap, it is so effective. Right. Uh, uh, is there anything special about uh, non-steroidal uh, MR antagonists? A, and, and B is how should we think about you know, I, I love the fact that people are doing research and new molecules are coming through with the aldosynthase inhibitors, but I'm sure they're going to be extremely expensive. Uh, so, you know, we have spironolactone. It's cheap. It's been around forever. Why should we be using a non-steroidal uh, MRAs and two of the aldosynthase inhibitors? What are the, you know, how do you see that playing out? Oh, it's a great question. I don't know, because, because companies do not do head-to-head -head studies with tablets that cost six cents a tablet. Uh, I don't think we know. So this is maybe where institutions like the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute in the United States and others that are interested in comparative effectiveness studies might have, play a key role because I'm hoping that we can put those questions to the test. Because right now we have things like Figaro, DKD, and Fidelio DKD, and they point the way toward using Finerin in diabetic kidney disease. But there's a very reasonable question to be asked. Well, could you just use something that costs way less? And uh, I don't think anybody knows. And so I think that should be remedied. If at all possible, I think it would be very useful to study those questions uh, soon, ideally. Um, 
So remains to be seen, as far as I can tell. Uh, and what do you think about the aldosynthase inhibitors? The aldosynthase inhibitors, those, I think they seem very uh, effective at lowering aldosterone. But what what I find interesting is if you look at the literature, it's actually really hard to keep aldosterone suppressed for long periods of time. So even if you use uh, angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors or other things, you can find evidence that the aldosterone breakthrough, where there's sort of baseline levels or higher of aldosterone, I, I always heard it's maybe 30%, but you can find studies that show it's a lot more than that. And uh, so really it's hard to chronically suppress it. And I don't know for sure whether this process of uh, inhibiting uh, CYP11B2 will be entirely effective over the long run. I I hope so. Uh, that that could be potentially useful, maybe. Uh, I guess one of the rationales that people bat around is whether as the aldosterone levels go up when you use spironolactone, which they often do, uh, might there be some sort of untoward uh, issue because of that, uh, because you haven't completely blocked the, the mineral aquatic receptor. That seems a little far-fetched to me because I think it's going up because you did block the mineral aquatic receptor, but we don't know too well what the answer to that is really. So I think, you know, I, I'd actually had been looking at a clinical trial that was going to answer a question like that, but the company that I was talking to about that got acquired and then they didn't, they, they changed their priorities about that, I think. So uh, I, but it's a great question. It's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, that's a pretty thoughtful answer. But and I can, if I can keep pushing you, uh, yep. when you add as a clinical pharmacologist, what do you yep. think about, you know, like amylaride, for example, is, is we we use a bunch of it here. It's an INAC inhibitor, um, but it doesn't block the aldo receptors elsewhere. Uh, how uh, and the only reason we use it is sometimes because of cost and access. Is that right. if someone doesn't tolerate higher doses of spironolactone. And epilerinone, phenerinone are going to be expensive, so we use cheap uh, old amyloride. Is that you know it low it, it increases potassium, it lowers blood pressure, but am I fooling myself that it's doing something good uh, because the other badness from aldosterone might still be happening? It's relatively unstudied, but I you know when I pointed out exactly what you're saying one time on Twitter, I remember our friend in New Mexico dropped some papers in the thread. There's one or two papers that show that you can stop this sort of steroid mineral uh, interaction that causes fibrosis in the heart, for example. You can stop that with a milleride as well. So I do think that there's something that places mineral corticoreceptor activation and, the, and then ENAC in specific right in the center of the damage that's done by the interaction of aldosterone and, and minerals. And so I think if you block ENAC, but I mean, this is based on one rodent study, so we don't really have a lot. Then there's the pathway three study. And in my recollection is the pathway three study showed that uh, amylaride works pretty well in, in resistant hypertension. But uh, I think that's all I know, actually, is those two studies. If there's anything else out there, I'm not aware of it. So I feel like it's a, it seems very promising that amylaride would be effective in that role, but I don't know. I, I feel like it's it's limited what we actually know about that. Fantastic. Um, thank you again for that wonderful overview, going back uh, to the historical times, uh, right down to new agents and, and, and your Fabulous work coming through. Uh, thanks, Brian, for doing this uh, virtually. Hopefully, we'll meet uh, in person some other day. Okay, thank you so much. Stop recording.